ಪಾಣಿಪಾಥೋಜಾಲೆ ವಿದ್ಯಾನ ಪ್ರವೀಣೆ ಜಡಬಧಿರಮುಖೇಭ್ಯೋಪಿ ಶೀಘ್ರನ್ನತೆಭ್ಯ ಕಾಮಾದೀನಾಂತರಾನ್ ಮತ್ ಸಹಜರಿಪುವರಾನ್ ದೇವಿ ನಿರ್ಮೂಲ್ಯ ವೇಗಾತ್ ವಿದ್ಯಾಂ ಶುದ್ಧಾಂಚ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ಕಮಲಜದಯಿತೆ ಸತ್ವರನ್ ದೇಹಿ ಮಹ್ಯಂ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಶ್ಲೋಕ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಆಚಾರ್ಯ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರೈಬ್ ಪ್ರಿಡಾಮಿನೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ತ್ರೀ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಪಾದ ದಿ ಇಂಪ್ಲಿಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದೇವೀಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರೈಬ್ what does sharadamba hold in her hands vidya mudra akshamala amrita kala amrita ghata vilasat pani pathoja jale pani pathoja pathoja refers to lotus so in her pani padmas devi is holding vidya a pustaka mudra chin mudra akshamala a japamala amrita kala amrita ghata a sudha kalasha so this is what devi is holding in her hands and what is she doing in the second pad ವಿದ್ಯಾನ ಪ್ರವೀಣೆ ಶಿ ಈಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಸ್ಕಿಲ್ಡ್ ಅಟ್ ಬೆಸ್ಟೋಯಿಂಗ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಅಪಾನ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ನತೆಭ್ಯ ಟು ದೋಸ್ ಹೂ ಡು ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಟು ಹೆಡ್ ಶಿ ಈಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಸ್ಕಿಲ್ಡ್ ಆರ್ ಶಿ ಈಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಕೇಪಬಲ್ ಇನ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ನಮ್ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಇನ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ನಮ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಈವನ್ ಇಫ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಜಡ ಬಧಿರಮುಖೇಭ್ಯೋಪಿ ಈವನ್ ಇಫ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಡೆಫ್ ಡಮ್ ಬ್ಲೈಂಡ್ ಮ್ಯೂಟ್ ಈವನ್ ಇಫ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಲೈಟ್ಲಿ ಡಲ್ ಶಿ ಕೆನ್ ಗಿವ್ ಶಿ ಕೆನ್ ರಿಮೂವ್ ಎನಿ ಆಬ್ಸ್ಟಿಕಲ್ಸ್ that they have and give them proper knowledge give them jnana in the third pada kamadin antaran mat sahajripu varan devi nirmulya we are asking that devi remove destroy the sahajripus the natural enemies that reside in our heart antaran kamadin kama krodha etc so this is the layout of this shloka however these are not just mere sambodhana these are not just some you know visheshana is put to address devi each of these have very each of these words have has a very particular background to it for example we discussed the form of devi a few episodes ago but now since we are talking about vidyam shuddhanja buddhin dehi because we are talking about jnana we shall now discuss the inner meaning of the objects that devi holds in her hands acharya also has told us many times that each object the mudra the chin mudra the pustaka the japamala and the aksha sutra all four of these have a very particular significance when it comes to jnana sadhana so as we said the chin mudra in a previous episode we have discussed the chin mudra at length but to recap the chin mudra represents jnana that jnana is of the nature of removing the jiva from the three times the three gunas the three shariras and uniting him with paramatma so that jeeva brahmaikya that is bereft of the mithya jagat that is the nature of jnana brahma satyam jagat mithya jeeva brahmaiva napara this is the nature of jnana this is what the jnana is and that is shown through the use of the chin mudra so the chin mudra is the jnana that needs to be gotten that needs to be obtained then in one hand devi has a pustaka a grantha this represents shastrik knowledge adhyayana so the shastrik knowledge is incredibly important for someone that wishes to get jnana study of our text itihasas puranas nyaya mimamsa adi shastras all of this needs to be read studied granthas literature needs to be studied for for the sake of obtaining jnana that is why we first have shravana and manana before we go to nirdhyasana shravana means listening to the vedanta tattva from a guru either through the upanishads or through other texts listening to the vedanta tattva from the guru 
and coming to the realization that everything that our literature is telling us is finding its true purport in advaita so whether it be itihasas puranas uh, all the upanishads whatever it be their true purport lies in advaita so knowing this from the speech of the guru from the teachings of the guru and from the upanishads and other vedantic texts so this is shravana then what is manana through the use of nyaya and mimamsa doing vichara and coming to the conclusion through oneself that yes whatever my teacher has told me whatever the upanishads whatever the upanishads are telling is true to do this retrospection you need nyaya and mimamsa so for all of this you need that shastra adhyayana so that book represents the shastra gnana then in one hand devi has a japamala this japamala is indicative of anushthana so it is not enough just to read but there needs to be some daily practice there needs to be a daily regimen that we have in place in order to move forward in our sadhana and the best implement for that is japa that is why bhagavan also says in gita yajna naam japa yajna asmi among all the yajnas i am japa yajna why in another smriti it is told ahimsaya cha bhuta naam japa yajna pravartate when it comes to japa there is no himsa so in things like upavasas and all there will be some uh, what do you say some fatigue caused to the body in other karmas maybe some harm may be done to either yourself or someone else or something there is a chance of that but when it comes to japa there is no harm caused to anyone there is no fatigue caused to anyone there is no ill effect caused to anyone there is only a good effect so in that way ahimsaya cha bhuta naam japa yajna pravartate so that japa is said to be the foremost of all observances and that japa mala is a sign of that japa because this upasana that is done the japa mala is indicative of upasana mantra japa this upasana acts as a bridge between the karma kanda and the gnana kanda japa in its original state will be treated as a karma it is something you have to do there is a process there are do's and don'ts there are niyamas so it starts as a karma but if done properly it will fructify and if coupled with vedanta sadhana it can end up as gnana sadhana because when you are doing japa first of all you will be inculcating inculcating ekagrata in your mind that single minded focus focusing on the mantra that nada that devata to the exclusion of all else that single minded focus that is crucial to niridhyasana is obtained through japa in the same way if you are doing anushthana properly and upasana properly you will be doing bhavana of the tattva of the devata that you are doing upasana of. so the upasya devata you should be seeking to firmly establish that devata in your mind and truly understand that devata so this is also why we call it ishvara upasana so when you understand the devata ishvara you know when you understand that root that form of bhagavan you will be getting closer and closer to understanding bhagavan's true nature that is why we have in the upanishad also sarvam khalvitam brahma tajjalan iti shanta upasita so tajjalan iti when you do that upasana of brahman when you do that brahma upasana when you do that bhavana of paramatma the bhavana should be tajjalan what does this word tajjalan mean it is a very peculiar, peculiar word it is a vedic word it is a chandasa prayoga tasmat jayate iti tajjam that from which the world is born is tajjam tasmin liyate iti tallam so the prapancha also gets laya in brahman and tasmad aniti pranati tad on that is how that word has come that is a chandasa portion the vedic portion so basically you should meditate upon brahman as that from which the world is born that from which, that in which the world the world dissolves and that from which the world draws breath from which the world draws its life its sustenance so basically you should meditate upon paramatma as the srishti sthiti laya karaka from whom the world is not different therefore shantaha the sadhaka will be calm and peaceful at mind when will the mind be agitated if you are meditating on one thing if there is a second object that your mind finds that is when the agitation will occur but in this way if you meditate upon paramatma you will find that the jagat is not separate from paramatma there is no second object other than paramatma and therefore the sadhaka's mind will be shanta unperturbed from what it is doing dhyana of and in that is shanta upasita you should do brahmopasana you should do the tattva vichara you should do the chintana bhavana of brahman in this way 
So that japa is the bridge that will take us from karma to be able to think of paramatma and in due course of time the shuddha atma in this way. So the japa mala is a sign of that. And there is a very beautiful shloka that is also there. It is a chart of adhyaya that about that japa mala. If you notice, the hand that bears that japa mala also has a parrot on top of it. So there is one shloka. Tava karra kamalastham sphatiki makshamalam nakhakirana vibhinnam dadimi bija buddhya pratikala manukarshan yena kiro nishiddhaha sabhavatu mama bhutyai vani te mandaha saha. This is one very nice shloka that was composed and it involves that japamala of Devi. So on that very same hand there is also a parrot. Parrots always want to eat something, some seeds or some... Some, some fruit or something, parrots will always want to eat something. And on top of that, the japamala that Devi is holding is a spatikakshamala. Why is it a spatikakshamala? In Shastra, there is one phalabheda that is told, japa done with rudraksha will give jnana. Japa done with a spatikakshamala will give moksha. So generally, we all are still in the stage where we want to get jnana. We still need chitta shuddhi. We still need that ekagrata because we are still trying for all of these. We usually use a rudrakshamala. People like sannyasis, paramahamsas, people rooted in the jnana marga, they will usually use spatikakshamala. Which is why if we notice when Acharya, when the Jagadguru comes out in the Rajavesha during Darbar in Navaratri, in the hand, Acharya will be holding a spatikakshamala. So in that way, that is why, because moksha is what Devi gives in the end, Devi is holding a spatikakshamala. And this patika is transparent. It does not have a color of its own, but it just shows the color of whatever is behind it. So in that way, Devi is holding the akshamala. Tava karakamala stam spartike akshamala nakakirana vibhinnam. So the tips of Devi's nails and also her hand also, they are all very red. Right? Because we call it a pani padma. And especially the tips of the nails will also be that light red in color. So when Devi is holding that Japamala with that hand, the, that redness of her nails is being found, is, is reflecting or not even reflecting, is being seen in the Spatika Akshamala because the Spatika is translucent, it is transparent. So this Kira, the, the Kira means the Shuka, the parrot, the parrot is looking at that Japamala that has turned red and is thinking that it is a, a group of pomegranate seeds. And therefore, thinking that that, uh, that otherwise clear Spatika Akshamala that has been made red by Devi's nails, thinking that that Akshamala is a series of pomegranate seeds, the Shuka, that, that parrot is trying to peck at it because it wants to swallow that uh, those pomegranate seeds. But then Devi with her smile, with a small smile, say te mandaha saha, with a small smile, Devi is diverting the, that parrot saying, this is not what you think it is. This is not, uh, see, this is not, these are not pomegranate seeds. This is a japamala. So you, you stop pulling that. Pratikala manukarshan kira. The kira, the parrot, is trying to pull at that japamala, thinking that it is a pomegranate seed. But yena kiro nishiddha saha mandaha saha. So that smile that Devi has smiled in order to divert the, the parrot away from the japamala, may that smile of Devi, that mandaha saha of Devi, May that give us bhuti, may that give us shreyas and sampat and all of that. In this shloka, as a dhvani, the nature of the jiva has also been shown. The jiva seeks happiness in the bahya prapancha. So, we, the jiva, out of his nature, is always acting externally. He thinks that the locus of happiness is external. And therefore, he seeks happiness in the jagat, rather than inside himself, which is where the ananda truly lies. And when the jiva does that, he needs someone to pull him away. He needs the Shastra Granthas that will tell him that Ananda is not outside, it is elsewhere. Or he needs a Guru that will tell him that Ananda is not elsewhere, it is within you. Or he needs the Anugraha Devata that will allow him to know that Ananda is not external, it is internal. In the same way, just as the Jiva thinks that Ananda is in the Jagat and then either through the grace of the Guru and the Shastra, he is pulled back. In the same way, this parrot also is looking at this patika. What is patika? It is, a, it is a particular type of stone. It is a type of gemstone. So it is hard and dry. But the kira, this shuka is thinking that 
that sweet succulent juicy pomegranate seed is found there so something that is dry and hard is being thought of as succulent and juicy so that is ananda right so the kira that shuka the parrot is thinking that its ananda will be found in that but that is obviously not the case whatever the shuka is thinking as a juicy pomegranate seed is actually a juiceless tasteless hard dry uh, gemstone so then even though even though this is the case the out of bhranti out of confusion the parrot is still trying to pull that jabamala but it is devi's hasa it is that the, the smile of devi that yena kiro nishiddha that the kira that that parrot is being pulled back from the japamala in the same way it is the grace of devi it is the grace of the guru it is the grace of devi as vangmaya because she is vangmaya rupini and she is guru mandala rupini so it is devi as the guru and as shastra that allows the jiva to pull himself back from this external jagat and allow him to find happiness himself in himself that is why the upanishad is also telling us kashchid dhira pratyagatmana maichata avritta chakshu ho so whoever wishes to know the pratyagatma the atma that is within you he needs to become avritta chakshu ho his indriyas need to become turned inward not outward he needs to be focused internally he should not let the indriyas run outwards into the jagat so all of this is told in that story involving the japamala so this is a very nice shloka that some kavi has we do not know even who wrote this shloka but it is a very beautiful shloka involving the japamala this is called bhranti madalankara in shastra but all in all this japamala is indicative of the anushthana that needs to be done so that japa that is conducive to gnana sadhana is indicated by the japamala so and then the last hand that we have is the amrita kalasha so the amrita is is uh, the amrita signifies uh, the ananda that is obtained so through gnana you get you get moksha in that state of moksha you experience ananda so that ananda is denoted by the amrita kalasha because uh, amrita is not is first of all it is very sweet so it it, it depicts ananda and the second thing is that amrita is uh, lasting so generally when we are talking about kshanika anandas fleeting pleasures the example that shastra usually gives is srak chandana vanita so srak and chandana so srak refers to a garland chandana is all these sugandha lepas and all that but a garland let us say so when you wear a garland it smells very good it looks very nice for how long maybe half an hour one hour after that the flowers wilt if you wait a day it will also start to smell bad so these things are all lasting pleasures but amrita is what devatas drink in heaven and that is experienced for a long amount of time so that is why we have some veda vakyas also apama soma amrita bhuma we have uh, enjoyed the yagas we have drunk the soma yagas and we have we have become amrita which means that we have we have obtained sukha for a very long period of time so amrita denotes lasting pleasure lasting happiness lasting sukha so moksha is of the same thing so when you get moksha moksha is forever nasa punaravartate there is no coming back into samsara once you have gotten jnana so it is that swaswarupa ananda experienced permanently so that ananda is denoted through the amrita kalasha so if we see in this way in the four hands one hand is the jnana so what is the jnana that needs to be obtained is shown by the chin mudra how do we get that jnana that is the pustaka and the japamala adhyana and anushthana will lead you to the jnana then through this jnana what is obtained ananda nitya ananda shashvata ananda that is moksha so in this way in devi's four hands the entire gamut of jnana sadhana has been shown and then in the next stanza we have vidyadana praveene in the next line we have vidyadana praveene jada badhira mukhe bhyo api shigran na devdaha devi will give jnana to anyone to get jnana you need two things there are things called bahya karanas and antara karanas so some uh, things are the external indriyas so you need to have eyes to see you need to have ears to listen to the vakyas of the guru you need to have eyes to be able to read texts you need to be able to speak in order to ask questions if you do not understand something so all of this is needed but these badhiras people who are deaf or andha people who are blind or muka people who cannot speak these people they may undergo some trouble when it comes to this jnana sadhana because the the mute people cannot ask questions the blind cannot read books the deaf cannot listen to the words of the guru but even to them devi is capable of removing whatever troubles that they have and giving them jnana it is not enough if just our indriyas are 
functional but that antarakarana the manas also needs to be functional the manas needs to be sharp the manas needs to be able to grasp subtle things that is why also in upanishad says drishyate tvagriya buddhya this atma tattva can only be even thought of by people who have a very sukshma darshana and also in addition to this uh, you should be able to retain whatever has been told you should understand what is taught and you should be able to retain it and all of this so all of this comes to the mind so the mind should be sharp if the mind is not sharp that person is called a jada so even to that jada devi is capable of removing the defects in his mind and his intellect and making him capable of getting jnana so that is why vidyadana praveene jada badhiramukhe bhyo api shikram na tebhya and the last thing that acharya is telling in the shloka is kamadin antaran mat sahajar bhavaran devi nirmulya vega so acharya is praying here for the removal of the ant the sahaja dikos the natural enemies such as kama and all and also here nirmulya so this is a lebanta having destroyed the lebanta denotes anantarya so only after the nirmulana will the shuddha vidya or the shuddha manas be so vidyam shuddha ancha buddhim dehi so kama adi nirmulya shuddha vidyam shuddha shuddha buddhim cha dehi only after the kama adi shatrus have been destroyed will a pure mind or jnana be obtained so here also acharya said kama adi shatrun so the enemies of whom kama is the foremost why is it that kama is the foremost because it is from kama that the krodha loka moha madamatsarya all spring forth if kama is uprooted everything else will be uprooted that is why like bhagavad pada also says in gita in the kama esha krodha esha shloka काम एव काम एव प्रतिहत प्रतिहतोस्ट and even within this kama is a sahaja dipu which is it is a natural enemy to us so here actually in the gita bhagavan says avrutam jnanam ete na jnanino nitya vaidana it conceals our jnana it covers up our jnana and then bhagavan also called it nitya vaidhi a nitya shatru so kama is a shatru why did bhagavan have to call it a nitya shatru there bhagavat pada writes a very beautiful bhash in the bhasha there bhagavat pada writes a very beautiful uh, sequence of lines explaining this saying that for a jnani kama will be seen as a shatru in the past present and future there is no point of time in which the jnani will not regard kama as a shatru because the jnani knows if i become beholden to kama i will commit a papa and thereby get dukha so kama is always an enemy to me jnani no nitya vairina but for a murkha what is the situation bhagavad pada writes that mitratve na the murkha will look at kama as a friend he will think i want something so let me feed this desire of mine as it will allow me to get what i want so whatever i want i i want it then and now i do not care if it is dharmic or adharmic so this desire is helping me in that so i will treat my desire as a friend and he will become beholden to the desire commit papas and then when he gets back the fruit of those papas as dukha he will realize and oh i thought that this desire was my friend but in the end it has caused me nothing but pain it has caused me nothing but sorrow therefore i have now understood that this desire is not a friend but a foe so for this mudha in the beginning this kama will be looked upon as a friend and only in the end will he realize that it is an enemy so for him it is not a nitya vai for the jnani do in the beginning middle and end Uh, at all points of time the jnani will regard kama as an enemy and therefore not even act on those adharmic desires so that is why bhagavan has very nicely said jnani no nitya vairina for a mudha it is not a nitya vairi but for a jnani kama is a nitya vairi because it can cause such calamities so therefore acharya is praying that kama and all the krodha loka moha madamatsarya that spring from kama may they all be removed from my heart because they are all sahaja dikos they are all my natural enemies so let us also pray for this let us also pray that they be remove those kama krodhas from our mind and in the next shloka we will see what it is that 
we need in this life so in regards to our body and mind our duties what is it that we should ask for when the background is jnana sadhana this we will see in the next episode namashankaraya namami shankaram